Shark's Cove here on the north shore of Oahu provides some amazing sights for people to see. And yes, this is the same Shark's Cove in which I filmed the introductory clip for lecture four. In fact, in the background here, you can probably even see the same reef slab on which I stood. But I don't think I would last very long on that reef slab today. And that's because today we have warning level surf hitting the north shore. Now, during the warmer months, the waters here are calm, clear, and the fish are very friendly. And the snorkeling, swimming and diving is just incredible. But during the colder months, and especially on a day like today, there will be no snorkeling. So here in Hawaii, before swimmers and snorkelers enter the water, factors like the size of the surf definitely need to be taken into consideration. In today's lecture, we talk about the solubility of a substance and the factors that affect it. So stay tuned. When most solutions form, especially those for which a solid solute dissolves in a liquid solvent, it's important to realize that only a certain amount of solute can actually dissolve. And that limiting amount is called the solubility. The solubility is defined as the maximum amount of solute that dissolves in a given amount of solvent. This is not the case for all solutions. In fact, many liquid, liquid solutions where two liquids dissolve each other, they can dissolve each other no matter what the proportions are. However, for many solutions, there is a limit that can be reached. And we can better understand how this limit is reached and what it is by the following thought experiment, which tells us to add too much salt to water. Too much meaning we know it's not all going to dissolve, but let's do it anyway and see what happens. Right after we add our salt to the water, we have this situation right here and the salt quickly settles down and it's going to start dissolving very quickly. However, right at the beginning, nothing has yet dissolved and so the concentration up here is pretty much zero. And the green arrows represent uh, the salt that's starting to dissolve. We can write the process by the following chemical equation, which says sodium chloride solid, if that's our salt of choice, dissolves into the aqueous phase. If you wait a little while, the concentration will start to increase up here. And a little while later, we see a few salt particles up here. It has not yet reached its limit. However, there is a little bit of concentration up here. Now, salt is still dissolving at a pretty high rate. However, with a little bit of salt already dissolved, some of these dissolved particles can actually recrystallize back into the solid phase. But since the dissolving is occurring much more rapidly than the recrystallization, the concentration will continue to increase up here until it reaches its limit. But right now, we can describe this by the chemical equation, which shows the solid dissolving into the aqueous phase. But some of the aqueous phase will recrystallize back into the solid. And that's described by the small pink arrow pointing backward. But since the rate is bigger going to the right, we know that it's not yet reached its limit. So the concentration is not the limit concentration. It's not the solubility yet. And we can describe it as unsaturated. If we wait a little while more, it will reach its limit. And we see a lot more salt dissolved up here. And with the extra salt particles that are dissolved, that means that more often, the salt particles can recrystallize as well. The more that is dissolved means the more that can recrystallize. So you still have salt that is dissolving. However, now you have just as many salt particles recrystallizing. And the two rates are equal and pointing in opposite directions. So the chemical equation looks like the following, where the solid 
dissolves into the aqueous phase, but the aqueous phase recrystallizes back into the solid at an equal and opposite rate. So this is a saturated solution. It has reached its limit. The concentration of a saturated solution is what the solubility concentration is. Now this is also another case of dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic meaning that there is still dissolving and recrystallizing occurring. However, it's an equilibrium situation because the concentration from this point forward would remain the same. You can probably recall another case of dynamic equilibrium. Several lectures back we saw that vapor pressure is also a case of dynamic equilibrium in which liquid vaporizes and recondenses at equal and opposite rates to each other and so the vapor pressure above the solution remains relatively constant. So our second case of dynamic equilibrium, we'll see several more before the course is through. Now since the concentration is saturated, you might think that it's not possible to have a larger concentration than this dissolved. This is the limiting concentration. We cannot exceed this concentration. However, that's not entirely true. It is possible to have a solution that has too much solute dissolved. And that's called a supersaturated solution. A supersaturated solution has more than the maximum amount of solute dissolved. So how can a supersaturated solution be made? How can we make one of these? Not like this. We need to make a supersaturated solution another way. And one way to make it is to take advantage of the fact that the solubility changes depending on the conditions. And one of the conditions that we can take advantage of is the temperature. The solubility is different at one temperature versus another temperature. And for most solids, the solubility increases as the temperature increases. So what we can do is dissolve a lot of solute in a hot solution and if we slowly cool that solution back down, the solubility will be less in the cooler solution. However, if it's slowly cooled down and not really disturbed at all, then that extra amount of solute will stay dissolved. It will not recrystallize out. But the key is you have to cool it down very slowly or else the solution is going to sense that it has too much dissolved and it's going to force the recrystallization to occur. Now we can do this with sugar and water. Sugar, the solubility increases with temperature. So the following example describes how we can make a super saturated solution containing too much sugar. The solubility of sucrose, which is table sugar, in water is the mole fraction at 25 degrees is 0.1 and at 100 degrees is 0.2. So the mole fraction doubles going from room temperature up to the boiling temperature of water. Mole fraction again is the number of moles of solute over the total number of moles in solution. So a mole fraction of 0.1 means that there is 0.1 mole of sucrose for every one mole entire of the solution. So what we can do is we can boil together nine moles of water and two moles of sucrose. Now if we boil these things together, then the solution will be pretty close to 100 degrees. That's the boiling temperature of water. Now, the mole fraction of the sucrose in this solution is going to be the two moles of sucrose over the total number of moles of solution, which is 
2 plus 9, so that's 11. So 2 over, over 11 gives you a mole fraction of 0.18. Now this mole fraction is less than the limiting solubility. At 100 degrees, we're able to achieve a mole fraction of 0.2. So we have not yet achieved this. This is not quite saturated, it's almost there, but it's still unsaturated. So if we take this hot solution and we cool it back down to room temperature very slowly, carefully, not disturbing it at all, then at 25 degrees, all of the solute should still remain dissolved. However, the mole fraction is still 0.18, but now it's larger than the solubility at this temperature. So there's too much sugar that is dissolved in this solution, and it's an unstable situation. Now the reason none of it has recrystallized out of solution yet is because crystals need another crystal to form. Crystals form on top of either another crystal or in imperfections in the glass, maybe little nooks and crannies in the glass of the container. However, if none of that is there, if, if the glass is nicely clean and polished and there are no other crystals in the solution, then the extra solute has nowhere to form. And so it remains dissolved in solution. This is an unstable solution and it's super saturated. If we disturb the solution in any way, then the solution is going to sense that there is too much dissolved and the extra solute will come out of solution. And you can disturb this in many ways, like possibly flicking the container or shaking it or even putting a stick or something like that or maybe a couple of other crystals inside the solution and then the crystals would start to come out. And so one way we can make the crystals come out is by placing maybe a wooden stick in the solution and now the extra solute has somewhere to form and it begins to form on top of that stick. And what will actually happen with these amounts, you'll end up forming one mole of sugar crystals on this stick. So one mole of sugar crystals have come out of solution and one mole remains in solution. And now the stuff that remains in solution is at the maximum concentration. And that's because the one mole that remains in solution divided by the 10 moles total, that's one mole in solution plus nine moles of water, so one over 10 is 0.1, and that's the maximum amount that can be dissolved at 25 degrees Celsius. So this is a saturated solution, and you now have one mole of sugar or a nice piece of rock candy to chew on. There are many factors that affect the solubility, and we'll discuss the three most important ones. These are the structure of solute and solvent, the temperature of solution, and the pressure surrounding the solution. We might mention one or two others. However, as we discuss all of these, it's important for us to keep in mind that they all ultimately depend on the energy and entropy of solution formation. If you watched lecture eight, then you should recall that in order for a solute to dissolve in a solvent, the solute particles will need to be separated, which will cost energy to break those interactions. And once it's dissolved in the solvent, new interactions are formed, which releases energy and depending on how much energy it costs and how much energy is released, that can either hinder or help the solution to form, which affects the solubility, of course. So let's keep that in mind. Let's also keep in mind the entropy. Entropy always works in favor of solution formation, and that's because two substances just have a tendency to mix together, that's the entropic effect, because of the random molecular motion of the particles that make up the two substances. So mixing just automatically happens by random particle motion.
So let's remember these as we continue. The first factor is the structure of solute and solvents. And we'll start by looking at a liquid-liquid solution. Two liquids either dissolve each other or do not. And we can usually predict when they do by the simple rule, like dissolves like. Now we mentioned this briefly in lecture two, but let's recall it here. Like dissolves like is telling us that polar liquids dissolve each other. Nonpolar liquids also dissolve each other, but polar liquids do not really dissolve nonpolar liquids. The reason for this rule is easy to understand by the structure. When we look at the structure of the two liquids in question, we can better see why we have this rule. For example, water and ethanol do dissolve each other. You would see a single solution phase. And we can see why by the structure of water, which is a triangular mo molecule. It has a dipole pointing up towards the oxygen because oxygen is electronegative. So this has a negative end and a positive end. Ethanol also has a dipole pointing towards its oxygen, so we have a negative end on this molecule and the positive end over there somewhere. And these dipoles can interact with each other, and that's how ethanol and water mix together, by the forces of interaction between the dipoles. So this is an energetic explanation for why these two dissolve. Another example is water and octane. The formula for octane is C8H18. However, it's written in this long form because you're being told that the structure is that of a very long molecule. All of these carbons are attached together in a long eight carbon chain. And the hydrogens are branched off of the carbons. So this is a nonpolar molecule and so it does not dissolve with water, or not really. Not really because a few molecules would dissolve in water. If you have a lot of water, then a few octane molecules would dissolve because of the random mixing that causes it, the entropic effect. However, the vast majority will not dissolve. And you would see two separate phases with the water underneath here and the octane up there. The last example shows a similar case, water and octanol. Octanol is the same as octane, except this last carbon isn't attached to three hydrogens. It's attached to two hydrogens and an OH group, this polar OH group. This polar group would make this little portion, this end of the molecule, kind of polar. However, the rest of the molecule is nonpolar, which makes it not want to dissolve in water. However, the small polar region would cause it to be slightly soluble in water. And so a little bit would dissolve, more than the octane. And we would call it slightly soluble. Now, if you have a lot of water and a lot of octanol, they're not all going to dissolve, and you'll still see the two separate phases. However, there would be a little bit of octanol dissolved down here in the water phase, and a little bit of water dissolved up there in the octanol phase. So the energetics are mostly the explanation for the effect of structure on the solubility here for liquid-liquid solutions. Solid-liquid solutions, we can consider molecular solids dissolving in water or ionic solids dissolving in water. Molecular solids are a little easier to predict. Polar solids usually dissolve in water and nonpolar solids usually do not. An example of a polar solid that does is glucose, C6H12O6, and I've drawn the structure using two different 
renditions. The first one is the shorthand organic type of notation, and the second one tells you where all of the atoms are. So we can see from this shorthand notation that there are a lot of OH groups, a lot of polar groups on this molecule, and so there are interactions between it and the polar water molecules, which help it dissolve. Nonpolar molecular solutes like iodine do not generally dissolve. Now ionic compounds are a little bit more unpredictable. And in order to predict when an ionic compound dissolves or does not dissolve, we in general need a solubility chart which tells us which compounds do, which do not, and which ones are slightly soluble in water. So you normally don't need to memorize the solubility chart, but it's good to be aware of a few of the more common ions. For instance, if an ionic compound contains the sodium cation, it pretty much always dissolves in water. An example is sodium chloride, which does dissolve in water, but silver chloride does not. So the structure definitely affects the solubility here, and it's explained mostly through the energetics, the forces of interaction. Gases dissolving in liquids. Gas molecules that are either polar or very large have a greater solubility in water. Now we can understand why polar gases would dissolve in water. That's because the dipoles on the gas particle would interact with the dipoles on the water molecules. And so that's an energetic explanation, pretty easy to understand. But what about the very large gas particles? Why would they be more apt to dissolve in water than smaller gas particles? It's because larger gas particles have an easier tendency or capability to form those temporary dipoles. If you recall lecture two, where we discussed temporary dipoles, Large molecules with more electrons means those electrons can more easily find themselves on one side of the molecule, leaving the other side partially positive. And so you would form a temporary dipole, and the larger the molecule, the easier it is for it to do that. And so those temporary dipoles can interact a little bit with the dipoles on water, so that would increase the solubility as well a little bit. So more energetic explanation here. Examples are the polar NO2, the polar H2S, and the nonpolar or atomic xenon. They all dissolve somewhat in water. Gases dissolving in solids are kind of rare. It would take a pretty porous solid for a gas to be able to dissolve in it. By that we mean the solid particles which make up the solid would have to be spread out a little bit in order to fit the little gas particles inside the solid. And it would take a small gas particle like maybe a hydrogen molecule to be able to work its way in throughout the solid. Kind of like a foam. Now this is a more entropic effect going on here because Entropy has to do with the tendency for things to mix, and if you have a solid where the particles are far apart, the gas particles, just being small enough, would just end up mixing throughout the solid given enough time. So more entropic effects. There could be a little bit of interaction, maybe some energetic effects as well, but probably more entropic. Gases dissolving with gases. Structure has no effect here. It doesn't matter what the structure of two gases are, they're going to mix because of the random molecular motion. So we described that before in our previous lecture. Solids dissolving with other solids. 
Now, this would require either melting both of the solids into the liquid phase and then mixing them together. And if that's the case, we can think of the solution as being a liquid, liquid solution because that's when it forms. And once it's cooled back down to the solid, that's just the particles freezing in place. But the two hot liquid solids would mix together based upon whether or not there are interactions between them, more energetic effect. However, another way for two solids to form a solution with each other is by crystallization. Now we discussed this a little bit in lecture six, so you might want to have a look at that lecture. An example of this would be ruby. Ruby is a crystal in which aluminum oxide, which is the normal pure crystal, has a few chromium 3 plus ions distributed throughout the crystal, and that's what gives it its nice red color. Otherwise, without those chromiums, it would be clear crystal. However, the aluminum oxide crystal would normally form, and with some chromium available, that would also end up mixing throughout the crystal. So it would involve mixing just by the availability of the chromium, and also the interactions between the chromium 3 pluses and the crystal lattice as well. So entropic and energetic effects there. Another important factor that affects the solubility is the temperature. And when solids dissolve in water, the trend is as follows. The solubility of most solids in water increases with temperature. The trend is described by the graph here, which plots on the y-axis solubility in grams solute per 100 grams solvent. So how many grams of solute can be dissolved in 100 grams of water? That's what's plotted. And we can see how the solubility changes as temperature increases. And for most of these five substances here, we can see that the solubility increases with temperature. Some increase sharply, like sodium nitrate, and others not so much, like sodium chloride. Sodium sulfate actually shows a decrease in solubility but that's kind of rare, and the normal trend is that there is an increase. Now what's the reason for this connection between temperature and solubility? Why is it that at hotter temperatures, more can be dissolved? Well, it helps if we can recall some information that we discussed in Lecture 8, where we talked about the energetics of solution formation. and sometimes when a solute dissolves, heat is required, and other times heat is released. When solids are dissolved in water, it's almost always the case that heat is required in order for the solution to form. And the reason is because it takes energy in the form of heat in order to break the interactions in the solid solute particles in order for them to mix with the solvent. So sometimes it can take quite a lot of energy to break those interactions. Well, hotter temperatures provide more heat energy, and so perhaps that's why more solute dissolves. The hotter temperatures with the more heat energy provides that necessary heat for the solute to dissolve, and that's why at hotter temperatures, more of it is dissolved. However, that's not the only thing that we need to consider, and we can see why if we look at the delta H of solution, which is the enthalpy change of solution. This is the amount of heat that's required for the solution to form. And for most of these, the delta H is positive. However, for sodium bromide, it's slightly negative, meaning a little bit of heat is released when sodium bromide dissolves in water. However, this kind of 
contradicts the fact that at hotter temperatures more sodium bromide dissolves. Why would hotter temperatures favor more dissolving if heat is actually released when it dissolves? So it doesn't really mesh with the enthalpy change. And also, if we look at sodium sulfate, a little bit of heat is required for sodium sulfate to dissolve. However, at hotter temperatures, less of it is dissolved. So that also is contradicting the enthalpy change. So there's something else that we need to think about besides just the enthalpy change, and that's the entropy change. The effect of temperature depends on both the enthalpy change, delta H of solution, and the entropy change, delta S of solution. If you recall also from lecture eight, the entropy is the measure of the amount of disorder in the particles. And when solute and solvent are mixed together to form a solution, the disorder increases. When they're separated and the solution is not formed, that's a more organized configuration. The entropy is lower. And when they're mixed together to form the solution, that's a more disordered configuration and the entropy is higher. So for most cases, the delta H of solution is positive, meaning heat's required, and also the delta S of solution is positive, meaning it's more disordered. That's in most cases, not always. Well, increasing the temperature means, of course, adding more heat, but it also means adding more disorder. And that's because of temperature being a measure of the amount of molecular motion. If you, you can recall, several lectures ago we talked about this. Temperature is a measure of the amount of thermal motion in the particles. Hotter temperatures means the particles are moving around more, they're shaking more. And so hotter temperatures means more shaking of the particles, they're more disordered now. And so increasing the temperature means that it favors heat being required and it also favors more disorder in the particles. So in most cases, increasing the temperature means more dissolving or more solubility. Now I think we can better understand these two cases of sodium bromide and sodium sulfate. You see, sodium bromide actually releases a little bit of heat. However, at hotter temperatures, more is dissolved. And that's because of the entropic effect. You see, hotter temperatures favors more disorder, and when sodium bromide dissolves, it's more disordered now. And that's why at hotter temperatures, even though a little bit of heat is released, more of it actually dissolves. So you have to consider both of these two factors. And for this case, the entropic factor kind of outweighs the energetic factor. Now for sodium sulfate, although a little bit of heat is required for the solution to form at hotter temperatures, less of it forms. Now the reason for this is rather interesting. When sodium sulfate dissolves, the particles do not become more disordered, they actually become more ordered. And I think we can understand this a little better by the following diagram. You see the entropy change in this case is negative. And so there's some ordering of the particles that's going on. Well, when sodium sulfate dissolves, it being an ionic compound, dissociates into its ions. It's negatively charged ions and it's positively charged ions. And when there are ions dissociated in water, the water molecules kind of order themselves around the ions. The negative end of the water molecule will point towards the cation. And so you have a lot of negative ends pointing towards cations. 
and the positive ends of the water molecules will point toward the anions. And so for certain ionic compounds, it just happens to be the case that there is a lot of ordering going on in the water molecules. And it just depends on which ionic compound you're talking about. For some of them, like sodium sulfate, there just happens to be a lot of order. And so at hotter temperatures, that tries to break up that order that's going on in the water molecules. And that's why at hotter temperatures, less of it is dissolved. You see, the water molecules don't want to be ordered like this at hotter temperatures because hotter temperatures, it's shaking all the molecules apart. Now, at this point in the course, we're not yet calculating delta S and comparing it to delta H. So we'll get to that later on when we discuss thermodynamics, but it's good to be aware that there are two factors that determine how much is dissolved. Now, for gases, the situation is pretty different. The solubility of all gases in water decreases with temperature. And we can see the trend in this graph right here, which plots four different gases, showing a decrease in the solubility. This time, solubility is measured in millimolar. But the reason for this opposite trend is easy to explain by just looking at the enthalpy change of solution. The enthalpy change of solution, if you remember, is composed of three different terms, which is the amount of heat required to break the solute interactions, the amount of heat required to separate some of the solvent interactions, and finally the amount of heat that's released when new interactions are formed between solute and solvent. However, when you're talking about a gas being dissolved, you can ignore this term right here because gas particles are already separated from each other. So there is no heat energy required to separate them because they're already separated. And out of these two terms, the heat released for mixing always greatly outweighs the heat required for separating some of the solvent. And so the enthalpy change for the solution is quite large and negative when gases are involved. And so when gases are involved, a lot of heat is released, which contradicts hotter temperatures. And that's why at hotter temperatures, less of the gas is actually dissolved. In addition to the structure and temperature affecting the solubility, the pressure can also affect it. However, this effect is not very significant unless it's a gas that's dissolving in a liquid. You see, the solubility of a gas in a liquid increases as its partial pressure above increases. And we can understand why it increases by looking at this situation right here. This is a gas trapped above a liquid, and up here we have a movable piston. So these gas particles are flying around within the confines of this container. It can be any gas. Let's just assume it's carbon dioxide. So every so often, one of these gas particles will collide with the surface of the liquid. And out of those collisions, a certain fraction of them will end up going into the liquid. So you will have gas dissolving in the liquid at a certain rate that depends on how often the collisions are. And so some of the gas will end up being dissolved. And these dissolved particles down here, sometimes they will come to the surface. And out of those that come to the surface, some of those will escape back into the gas phase. So every so often, one of these particles that is dissolved will end up escaping. And there will be a certain rate of escaping that depends on the concentration that is dissolved. Now, if we let this system settle down, then it will reach a point where the rate at which it dissolves is equal to the rate at which it escapes. And that's a point of equilibrium. 
in fact, dynamic equilibrium. And we can represent that by the chemical equation, carbon dioxide gas dissolves into the aqueous phase as fast, it is, as, fast as it is escaping back into the gas phase. So the arrows are equal and pointing in opposite directions. Now, if this piston were lowered to some lower value, then the partial pressure of the gas up here is increased, and now collisions are occurring with the liquid more often. But we haven't yet given enough time for the concentration to really build up yet, so the rate at which it is escaping is still small, but now with the extra partial pressure, the rate at dissolving is greater. So we can represent this by the equation in which the arrow going towards the aqueous phase is longer than the arrow going back. And so the concentration will start to increase down here in the liquid phase. If you wait a little while, then it will settle down again and reach a point of equilibrium. And at this point, the rate of dissolving equals the rate of escape. And you can represent that by the chemical equation right here. Another case of dynamic equilibrium. And at that point, the concentration is now greater than it was before. So we see how lowering the piston, which increases the partial pressure, causes more to be dissolved. Now Henry's law tells us not only that it does increase, but it also tells us how much it increases. Henry's law states that the solubility of the gas, which is the concentration, is equal to a constant times the partial pressure of the gas above. So this is a very simple relationship. It says that the concentration of dissolved gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above. And what this means is that if you double the partial pressure of the gas above, then its dissolved concentration also doubles. If you triple the partial pressure of the gas above, then its concentration triples, and so on. Now the constant, which is Henry's Law constant, is different for the various gases out there. And I've listed several gases here, along with their Henry's Law constants. Oxygen, for instance, has a Henry's Law constant in water at 25 degrees Celsius of 0 0.0013 molarity per atmosphere. And what this means is that if oxygen is trapped above water at a partial pressure of one atmosphere, then the concentration down here would be 0 0.0013 molarity. If the partial pressure is doubled to two atmospheres, then the concentration would be twice this much, 0 0.0026. And if it's tripled, then the concentration of dissolved oxygen would be three times that much. And so you, you get the picture. Several others are listed right here. And these bottom three, NO2, N2O and CO2, I've taken and I've plotted them over here on this graph. The NO2, N2O, and CO2. I'll show you those constants one more time. We see that CO2, its concentration would be greater than that of N2O and NO2. So at one atmosphere, of partial pressure above the liquid, CO2 would be at a concentration of 0 0.034 molarity, which is about right there. And N2O would only be at 0 0.024 molarity, and the NO2 would be at 0 0.012. So the CO2 will always have more dissolved in the liquid than the other two. And at two atmospheres, the concentrations would be twice these values, and at three atmospheres it would be three times, four atmospheres four times, and so on. So this graph can help you predict what the molarity is at any partial pressure above. But we don't need the graph, we can just use Henry's Law, the equation. So for instance, what pressure of CO2 is required to keep 
the concentration of CO2 in a bottle of root beer at 0.13 molarity. So here you're given the concentration and you're asked for what is the pressure. Well, you know what the Henry's Law constant is for CO2 and you know the desired molarity so we can plug those two into Henry's Law and solve for the pressure. And when you do that, you get 0.13 molarity divided by 0.034 molarity per atmosphere. And you see how the molarities cancel out and the atmosphere comes back up. You end up with 3.8 atmospheres. So when you open a bottle of root beer and you hear that, psh, that's the excess pressure coming off. So this is our uh, concluding slide for this lecture. In our next lecture, we will discuss colligative properties of solutions. And these are properties that solutions have that pure solvents do not have. So stay tuned for that. Aloha. <laughs>